I, I seem to use um, near-death experiences as my segue from one career <laughs> to another. And I, it's not something I highly recommend. Um, it's a little overly dramatic. This is the Anthropology Podcast. The podcast where we optimize the bodies, brains, and lifestyles of entrepreneurs, go-getters, and world-changing innovators. Welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Walker. As an anthropologist and naturopathic doctor, I optimize the health and performance of badass women working to change the world as entrepreneurs and go-getters. You know, people exactly like you. Your business, body, balance, and inner badass. These are the themes we are exploring. Before we jump into the interview, I want to invite you to join our free Facebook community, Legacy. If you want to be something amazing, you need to surround yourself with amazing people. The legacy community is made up of badass women living, not leaving, but living our legacy every single day. We are leaders, parents, entrepreneurs, and innovators collectively committed to leaving the world better than we found it. My mission is to support the health and optimization of these badass superheroes, literally to places we never thought imaginable. If you are on a mission and get it that your health is the key to your unlimited potential, then join us. We are super awesome. You can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash DE legacy. See you there. So today's guest is a perfect encapsulation of what anthropology is all about. Sydney Marr is a multi-passionate entrepreneur with a flair for reinvention, believing that lessons and skills learned as you go through life are something that can serve you later on in compelling and amplifying ways. Early in her career, she suffered a tragic accident as a national level competitive figure skater and then found herself in the fashion world. She leveraged the discipline that she learned as a skater and used this to be able to build a fashion empire where her clothing was featured on QVC in eight countries for over 15 years. A second health scare, a near-death experience for her, um, caused her to transition her career once again to not only focus on fashion, but actually start to emerge in the wellness space. She was able to launch her own supplement line and in this interview gave us really incredible insight in terms of the launching of a product, the way of thinking as an entrepreneur, and how to serve people in a really big way. We most definitely spoke about health, but we really and in particular talked about the business of building products for people. Sydney has a business now that assists practitioners or other entrepreneurs to take a product idea and actually start to bring it to market. I know so many of you in our audience are entrepreneurs. You've got ideas and you're looking about how to make that happen, but you also value your health. Sydney's story is the perfect blending of these two values, and I know you're going to find it tremendously interesting. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Sydney Marr. Sydney Marr, welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. It's been a beautiful summer and I've been looking so forward to chatting with you. Well, we have a number of things to uh, to get into and, and you are this perfect encapsulation of our audience in that you're an entrepreneur and you're a wellness enthusiast. And, and so I'd love to hear a little bit about your story in terms of where, where you've traveled uh, as an entrepreneur and, and as an individual and really the journey that got you to uh, that got you to this place now. Well, this is a, a really superb question, Megan, because I am, um, I'm going to say T17 away from turning 60. So I've been very reflective in the last few months about where I have come from. And when I started off, I was uh, living in Vancouver as a child with my parents. I was an elite athlete. I was on the national team in, as a competitive figure skater. So really learning how to uh, take care of myself, what was going to nourish me well, so that I could um, jump high, that I could skate faster, that I could remember all of those complicated choreographies and perform at my best. And uh, that's really what I thought I was going to be. I, I thought I was going to go, you know, as they say, sail off into the wild blue yonder, you know, doing the, you know, dying swan thing till the end of time as a skater. Um, I still think that skating is... Uh, um, a more natural environment for me. I think walking is a strange and unnatural act. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I was this prodigy child and I 
was hurt in a skating accident. In fact, I was almost killed at uh, 18. I was, um, you know, in skating, they don't have seating in the way that tennis does. But I was the next skater they thought was going to win the Canadian championship. I was supposed to go international that year. I wanted those titles. And I also was not only technically brilliant, I was a performance skater because I was a junior when Karen Magnuson and Toller Cranston were seniors. So I really wanted to learn all of the techniques to express something happy, something sad, something wistful. And this accident just slayed me. I mean, it literally took my legs out from under me. My um, my leg was uh, almost cut off. Uh, the sciatic nerve was cut by two thirds. And all of a sudden, I not only, it wasn't a question of how high can I jump, I couldn't even walk. Hmm. It was really, really, it was devastating. And probably, I'm going to say a good thing that the, I came to understand that the, um, that the healing, that the uh, therapy, the being able to walk again was going to be about a year and a half. My doctor was brilliant. He brought five um, U.S. doctors from uh, the States to come up and do the first micronerve surgery on my leg. And thank goodness it was successful. They made teaching tapes for the universities here in Canada. And because of my background in skating and knowing how to nourish myself, I was able to, you know, put myself back together like Humpty Dumpty. I learned how to walk again. I was um, really practicing it. I was up at the uh, at SFU with the um, other uh, athletes, you know, training. Uh, because in my mind, I was going back to I was going back to compete, and probably because it took so long, it was I was able to process that I wasn't going to skate again, at least not competitively. And this gave me the time to process it and to also uh, put into action because if you know how kids are, you know, I was an overactive 18 year old and you tell tell an overactive 18 year old to sit still and do nothing. It's kind of hard. In fact, they put me under house arrest before the corrective surgery because I wouldn't stay still. And um, they said we can't do the operation unless we either put you in the hospital for two weeks before or you stay home and stop going out dancing every night. <laughs> you know, I, I was falling down. My, my friends would just say, hey, you know, like, let's go dancing. I said, oh, okay. And if I fell down, they just picked me up. We all need friends like that. Oh, you bet. You know, some, there's something really nourishing about knowing that your friends will pick you up. And uh, this also was... Um, part of, I'm going to say, part of the healing process. And because I was very good at um, the expressive side, I had learned how to sew and how to um, not only make my skating costumes, I made lots of uh, skating costumes for the other skaters and um, for the carnivals and to sew fashions for myself. So in my, you know, I'm going to say the time that I was getting better, I went back to school. I went to fashion. And I graduated and uh, really put all of my uh, energy and attention to it. And at the time, so it was very much a transition from learning how to um, apply all of the things I had learned in skating to my next potential career. And at the time when I learned that I could not compete again. And it was really one of the young skaters. Uh, his name was Dennis Coy, who came to me and he was very precocious and he none of the other kids had the courage to say it to me. And I guess none of the other parents did either. Um, he said, Sid, he said, you're never going to compete again. And he was 14 years old. And I, it just, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And it was really the thing I needed to hear. I needed to you know, I was very angry at the moment, you know, and it's like for any of us, whether or not it's a breakup of a relationship, whether or not it's um, a change that we need to face, maybe a, a home change or a death of someone in our family. Uh, the thing that kind of strikes us that then we, we say, OK, this is not final, but it is something that I need to accept, process, make friends with and to look at that and say, this is a challenge 
where what's the gift? Because I have found time over time that when there's been a massive challenge in my life, there's also a deep gift inside of it. And so it's almost like you need to get low and to to ground yourself to be able to see it because there is a gift. I was able to transform all of that pent up energy into learning how to become a wonderful fashion designer. And 36 years later, I really can say I had a wonderful career in fashion. Well, it's incredible that you were able to take your confrontation with the truth that way and move it in a direction that has been so positive for you. Like, did you have an inherent uh, positive psychology or resources around you that enabled you to do that? Because I, I just, I don't see everyone moving in that direction. Well, I think I was also blessed that my skating coach and mentor, his name was Brian Power, uh, he didn't teach us how to become competitive figure skaters. He taught us an approach to life. And I realized that when I was studying in fashion, you know, I was in my crutches and going to school, um, that I just had to apply you know, my discipline, how to study. I mean, in skating, we had notebooks and, you know, this is how you do your figures. This is how you correct it. This is how you keep doing it. If it, how many times did it take me to do that? Uh, How long did it take me to learn how to do a double axle? And so when I was sketching, I didn't say, oh, the first one didn't come out. Oh, the second one didn't come out. I just did it until it was right. And I remember one of my skating coaches I had challenged and I said, well, how many times do I have to do, you know, a double axel, you know, and to get it right? And he kind of looked at me and he said, until you get it right. Right. Yeah. Which is which is fantastic advice. And I, I love the way that your experiences on life have sort of built upon one another to bring you to where you are at now. And I know one of the things that you focus on in your current career is uh, not only developing new products, but helping people to develop their own products. And I want to talk about that a little bit because I know we have our audience as entrepreneurs. And so, you know, I find one of the challenges is we get a guest on and the guest will be like, oh, you know, we've built this, we've built this empire. And what everyone really wants to know is what were the first 10 steps you took to get to where you are at now? Can you talk to us about like those early days? Like what did you do to go from, I got this cool thing. I just don't know what to do next with it. What do we do? Well, first of all, I'll, I'll describe my journey. Uh, as a, a creative person who loved making things, and I went back to school and I learned how to, you know, be a pattern maker and a couturier and how to do draping. So not everybody who has an idea, as you said, here in, um, you know, our, our viewers or, or our listeners, would they um, necessarily want to go back to school? So the first 10 steps is it really is to uh, challenge yourself and to capture the ideas. I find that many people uh, like um, Megan, if we went to coffee and or had a tea, we would probably hear someone at the next table saying, oh, I have an idea for this or my kid put on a backpack and and this is a problem or, you know, I'm tired of using Ziplocs and what can I create? You know, I created these little, you know, homemade things and I'd love to do something with it. So there's people teeming with ideas. And when you're resolving a problem, when we look at, you know, if I can't find it, how you know, then maybe other people can't find it. And we start researching and seeing, is there an idea? Is this an idea worth developing? But get it out of your head. I find that people, you know, they just have so many years and and I've almost done averages on this. It seems that people kind of sit on ideas or they struggle through their ideas because they're in, it's almost like an incomplete sentence if it's half in their head. You know, if you get it on paper, if you look at it and say, okay, dissect it, say, what are the first parts that I have to do? Do I have to define the idea? Do I then have to go back and do my research? Do I have to share it with my friends? Shall I make a sample? What are the parts that you love about your idea? Because we all come to the table with different talents, right? So when I'm talking to my clients, I always try to find out the part that nourishes them, the part that really lights them up that they get excited about because that's the part I want to make sure they continue to do the then so this is about identifying your resources so the part you always want to do the part that that lights you up 
and the parts that you're not good at, maybe it's logistics, maybe it's about costing, maybe it's about um, finding the manufacturers, because that can be complicated. Because sometimes when you have an idea, you get so attached to it that the first person who says they're going to help you with it, you develop a relationship with. And then you don't want to leave that manufacturer or person who's helping you because even if they're not the person that's necessarily going to solve or or resolve your scaling up. So there, you kind of have to step back and look at the 10,000 foot view. Like what do I want to make? Who do I want to serve? What are my resources? And then where do I envision this going? It's almost like you have to look back or look forward and as if you were looking at a memory of something that already happened so that you can, you can, Think about the things that might come up that you're going to have to put into place. And then you go back to the small thing. What is it I'm going to develop? So it's really fun because this gives you sort of like the beginning and the end. And then you can see that you can make it bigger or smaller depending on what your um, what your product is, what your resources are, be it financial or uh, do you have pattern makers? Do you have people who can sketch it up? Do you have technical people? Do you need a, a patent lawyer? So when you put it all on paper, somehow I find that that as an action plan takes the fear out of it. Does that make sense? It totally does. And when you got, when you got started, like where was the disconnect between you're like, I, I can build this and I'm going to start to take action. Like what things caught you by surprise? I actually... On the fashion side, when I started, my dad came to me and he said, you know, I have this um, uh, small insurance, uh, term insurance that I'm going to um, cash in and give you. It was a very small amount. I think it was like $1,500. And um, he said, so that you can make, you know, what you um, make your collection. And so I just sat down. I designed it. I went and got the fabrics and I made it and I realized that I was, you know, I was pretty much still a child. I was 21 years old. And I thought, I'm not going to get a salesman. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to stand up in front of the buyers. I'm going to go knock on doors. And they loved what I had. And I listened to them. And I I made uh, a big success, actually, of them you know, I collected together the orders, I went and got the information. And then I, you know, for financing, I, you know, of the bigger orders, I went back to the bank, and I plopped in front of the banker. And I said, Hi, I have these orders, I need to get a line of credit. And I just started learning everything that I needed to about how to calculate all of the fabric and how to bring in sewers and to, you know, produce them and to get them packed up and shipped on time. So I think that, you know, my parents were entrepreneurs, so I didn't have big, big challenges then. But what I do find is that people, as you were asking me a little earlier in our conversation about, you know, in terms of um, the the financing and all of that, I think that you should start off by being resourceful. And, and I'm going to say start small. So start looking at you know, getting the products made, start looking at, you know, what are the um, resources, as I said, that you have at hand, because there can be bigger challenges. And one of the things that, you know, I, I see my clients making a mistake, let's say they're, they have a hobby, and then they want to turn it into a business. So it costs them $25, they sell it for 50. And then Trader Joe's comes along and says, that's a great product. But you can't, you can't do that. They, you can't do, if you get your costing wrong from the beginning, mm-hmm. you aren't going to, even if you don't have, um, even if it costs you more in the beginning, but if you cost it properly, you can go back and you'll have the structure in there to go and buy at a higher volume so that you can accept a wholesale order from someone like Trader Joe's. So, you know, that is probably one of the the big challenges that I find um, my clients coming up against. Um, you know, I then, you know, later, I mean, in all of the products I've done, I mean, I've processed over $300 million worth of orders in my career in fashion and in jewelry and homewares and and all of that kind of product and for uh, clients such as, um, you know, everyone from 
uh, the room, uh, which you may be um, mm-hmm. familiar with, uh, which is now part of the Bay, yep. um, to Walmart, to Cirque du Soleil. In fact, um, you know, I just the, uh, was reached out uh, to the director of global merchandising at Cirque du Soleil because I had actually created their first most successful boutique program for the um, for the shows. And so I'm actually meeting with her in a few weeks. So, you know, there's there's a part about being brutally honest with what you have and what you do know and what you don't know, and yet having faith and optimism in going out to find out what you need. And and I think this is really important. So it's a really fun or funny balance between being brutally honest and being courageous and optimistic. Well, and there were three concepts that you touched on, and you didn't call them out specifically, but I wrote them down as you were talking. And you noted that whatever your product idea is, it needs to actually solve a problem, as opposed to, I call it the the Segway effect. Like the Segway human transporter was this really cool product. It just didn't have a use. So it never really it never really took off. So you mentioned solving a problem, which I think is really important for for entrepreneurs to note. And then you also said, you know, I just listened, I would, I would pitch a group of people and I would listen to their feedback. And I find so many entrepreneurs are so focused on getting their idea out that they, they deny or block or don't listen to the feedback that's coming their way. So I wanted to point out that. And then the third one that you just threw out there and you called it pretty explicitly was this notion of planning. You need to be able to plan to scale whatever it is that you are going to do. And I see that a lot with, uh, with entrepreneurs as well, that they're just in such a rush to get it out there. Um, that they skipped those three steps and they're just so critical um, to be successful, which is what I think everyone's after anyway. Yeah, I think having an action plan because then, you know, and I like breaking it down into, um, is it a three-month plan, a year plan, a five-year plan? And then you that means you can break it down into say, I have to do this this week and it moves the needle forward. And I think that I inadvertently learned that when I was a skater because my mom had to get me up at 4.30 in the morning because... And, and I, it's funny because even still with my travels, I don't think about what time I have to be there I, uh, or what time is my flight taking off. I always think about what time do I have to get up. So I back everything out. So get up at 4.30. I have to um, kind of slowly wake up, have my breakfast, get my skates. Maybe I've prepared my skates the, day, the night before, um, get changed. Uh, someone's picking me up at 5.30. Uh, nap in the car on but so backing everything out makes it all doable and that way you don't go into overwhelm and then it never happens and that's how I have you know I'm going to say um, upset um, entrepreneurs who have great ideas because this is what they've been going through for the last few years when they land on my doorstep and the first thing we do is make a plan yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's once you move out of the phase of idea and into action, things are things are going to change. And it's not about the dopamine and excitement anymore. Now it's like it's the hard work and it's the step by step. And uh, and I love that you've broken it down for people. I want to hear a little bit more about how you made the the transition or I'm going to say incorporation of, of health and wellness into your purview of uh, entrepreneurial outlets. Can you share with us a little bit about uh, how that transition happened? Yes. Well, um, I think, first of all, I had uh, quite an illustrious um, career in fashion, and I, I seem to use um, near-death experiences as my segue from one career <laughs> to another. And I, it's not something I highly recommend. Um, it's a little overly dramatic. But uh, about five years ago, uh, I was 54 going on 55. I managed to catch um, mono. And you're you know, as most of us know, you're supposed to get it when you're 12 or 18 and, you know, kiss a guy and get, you know, uh, <laughs> get mono or something. And um, and what happened was it actually crashed my immune system. And here I was, this fashion designer who was traveling all over the world doing my shows in Italy and Germany and in London. And all of a sudden, I'm so sick, I'm in the hospital. That event actually really stopped me cold. I I ended up being in the hospital for two months. I had to give a power of attorney to my staff so they could keep running the company. I said, if I survive, great. If the company survives, great. And, you know, um, I actually opened QVC Italia from my hospital bed. So with that, my 
getting better, my body had taken such a an inflammation that I lost almost all my hair, actually more than 65% of it in one fell swoop 90 days later after, you know, the, I guess the, the massive inflammation. And um, that is really what galvanized me to look m- more closely. I uh, What happened was I was so frail and weak and just getting on my feet. In fact, I had to have my best friend travel with me because I couldn't even carry my cases, um, you know, like, you know, off and on the planes and things like that. And so I couldn't take the heavy pharma meds that the hair doctor wanted me to take. And my naturopath felt sorry for me because I didn't want to wear a wig and I didn't really have enough hair to put extensions on. And he said, let me try this. And so he had um, created what was the beginning of the formula that made my hair grow back like crazy. And within two months, it was, I was a human Chia pet. And I said, (laughs) oh my goodness, (laughs) I am going to be your new best friend. So I also realized that it was a time where I needed to recalibrate my life. So I started winding down my, you know, my fashion business, uh, completing my contracts with the TV uh, stations around the world. And in the background of that, Megan, I started building a, a wellness line. I thought if this is if this has happened to me and this is a, a natural remedy that I can offer to the world, I'm going to do this. And so I built out a line. I went back and worked with him and the uh, boutique manufacturer. And I said, I'm going to be your new best friend. And so that's how I created Sydney Mar Wellness, which is a, um, they're more like medicinal supplements because they are a therapeutic caliber. And um, it, it's really fun. Um, to be able to help people to help them uh, get better and naturally, you know, so there's about 12 products. So that was really how I went in that direction. But I also had a lot of background from uh, being an elite athlete. Um, Actually, my first uh, introduction to vitamins and supplements was because my mother was a, a businesswoman. And she, uh, I guess I was driving her crazy. I was 13 years old and she dragged me off to the doctor and said, she's making me crazy, you know, give her drugs. Uh, (laughs) And he said, "Uh, no, Mrs. Marr, I'm, you know, with all due respect, let's talk about the fact that she's going to be getting her period soon. She probably just needs, you know, some calcium and magnesium and started explaining to us, you know, how, how, Um, making sure that I had enough calcium was going to calm my nerves. It was going to be not only good for my bones, it was going to, um, you know, and how it worked in the body. And so I started studying it at that age. And also because I wanted to learn um, how to jump higher and to uh, remember all of my choreographies and, you know, hopefully not make my mom nuts. That's a driver for a lot of us, right? Not driving our parents not driving our parents crazy. How have you found the development of um, like a nutraceutical product line in the supplement world the same or different from developing products in in fashion? First of all, because I couldn't bury my over 30 years in fashion, I, you know, because being a QVC um, presenter, uh, they built up a lot of SEO on my name, and that's really why I put my name on it. So I, I needed to, you know, look at the segue between Sydney Marr, the fashion designer, and Sydney Marr Wellness, because I thought, I can't present myself as a naturopath. So I decided to, you know, what they say when, you know, uh, to incorporate. And, and actually, that's um, one of my design teachers uh, taught me in um Draping, she said, if you make a mistake, because it's uh, draping is all about working with the the medium, the mete, the fabric, and you literally drape it on body. And sometimes as you're cutting, because it's all freehand, you can make a mistake. And she said, just stop and study it and try to incorporate the mistake. So for me, it wasn't a mistake that I was in fashion before, but I knew that I couldn't bury it. So I incorporated, I wanted, I felt that people would be attracted to me because, um, I had um, a viewership, you know, in fashion, and I thought they're going to come to me first because uh, not because they're worried about their health, but because they're worried about their beauty, the loss of beauty. So they're going to come running to me first because their hair is falling out. So talking about solving a problem, having a natural remedy and uh, looking at 
how could I incorporate that story into who I am and who I serve? And I think that that was really important for me to recognize. And it gave me the time to also learn about, you know, ingestibles are very a very different category than fashion. I mean, I always wanted women to feel um, a, what I call everyday fabulous when I was designing. And for me now, again, um, as incorporating my story, it's everyday fabulous, but from the inside out. Yeah, I love how you're working with those two pieces. And and what is great about it is it's authentic. So you're you're not sitting there being like, well, how do I present myself in a in a way that's going to sell? You're like, I'm going to present myself in a way that's totally authentic and, and leverages what I'm already great at. Exactly. And there was a story and I needed, you know, I also took the opportunity and maybe someone else would think I'm crazy um, to create my own website, to Uh, understand it and sort of sit with it and look at it and see how am I going to be perceived. I found my voice as a a wellness enthusiast because I was sharing anecdotal stories, Uh, stories either, you know, of my friends and family, my own stories, um, how I experienced it, because this was part of my journey that I was sharing and offering people Uh, access to this type of formulation that was going to cross fingers, make them feel better, look better. So I'm really in the the health and beauty aspect of nutraceuticals. Um, And I also wanted to incorporate you know, like our formulations are long and complicated and, and, and the formulators at the manufacturer, they always laugh their heads off at me because I'm, I'm still a lay person. I'm not a naturopath. I'm very um, knowledgeable, but I'm not a naturopath. So sometimes I look at the formulation and say, well, what's that? And they kind of laugh at me. But I wanted to simplify it. I wanted someone to go into a store or look online and say, oh, fabulous hair, skin and nails. I, I know what it's for. I don't have to read everything to say, oh, and figure it out. And, you know, yes, of course, they're welcome to. And all of my labels are on, on, you know, the website so they can download them and take them to their healthcare practitioner so they can share them and make sure there's no contraindications. Um, But I wanted to simplify healthy choices. And I also, for myself, as part of my journey, when I was sick, I hated my medications. I looked at the little ugly, you know, uh, pill containers and, and, they weren't very inspiring and I had to take them and, and and I thought my bottles are going to be happy looking and they're going to talk to the people who look at them and uh, look at where they want to go, that I'm going to have fabulous hair, that I'm going to have beautiful skin, I'm going to have happy cells. And that was basically the name, is, you know, the claim in terms of like guiding them to choose well. So this was part of I guess I used my design background to help me incorporate and to simplify for the people who are going to be hopefully looking to have a remedy that was natural and didn't make them crazy trying to figure out what the heck this stuff did. Well, and you brought something really powerful to the table, which is the consumer experience of health. And I, I, when I'm coaching practitioners on business, it's always fascinating because they'll have this idea or we'll move down a thing. And I'm like, you're, you're giving us the practitioner's experience of health, but this isn't the same way that consumers actually want to participate in it or pick it up or, or use it. Um, and I think that's part of the power of what you're, you're doing and, and why you have the reach that you have um, is because you, you're coming at it from an entirely different perspective. But acquiring the resources you need to make sure that you're you're producing quality products. It's an important um, distinction as we're looking at, uh, at what you've built. Yes. And there's funny things. I mean, when I first started designing, you know, the, the actual bottles, I was thinking, oh, I want to have glass and oh, I want to have this. And then I thought, oh, first of all, glass can break. It can um, you know, I, 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 I'm always concerned about, say, dropping a glass in my kitchen. I happen to be lucky I have cork floors. So I, I worry less about, you know, any breakages. And I thought, you know, what the heck's wrong with a, a beautiful label on a simple um, recyclable bottle at some point in time? I looked into bottles that were actually um, the ones that uh, break down, but I I'm, I'm wasn't satisfied at the time that they were going to last as long because my vitamins... Um, 
the shelf life is three years and they were only lasting, I think, for a year and a half or so. And I thought, well, that's no good. My, my product is going to outlast, you know, the uh, the expiry date is going to outlast the, the bottle. The that packaging, it's in. yeah. Yeah. So then I made a choice to have um, paper labels because they, of course, uh, break down better than a vinyl label. So, you know, just being conscious. And then I put the the information that goes on the back of the label, which you can get with a vinyl label inside because my my. Uh, products are packaged in a little organza bag with information and that uh, the back of the label so that it, it still uh, meets all the NPN requirements. I want to hear a little bit more about how now that you're not just in in fashion and now you're working with natural health products and you have a, you have a different vantage point on health than you've ever had before, how does this lifestyle support and help you as an entrepreneur? Well, that's a great question. Um, first of all, I am very, very consistent in my own self-care. And I think that that may have been my, you know, um, red flag uh, when I was overworking, shall we say, traveling too much for my fashion career, you know, needing to be, you know, in, in all these different countries. Today, I am very conscious of to make sure that I drink enough water, that I eat enough protein, that I you know, not only have the right shape that I exercise. And so there's, these are some of the things that I also help my um, wellness clients because I have something that I help them with because my supplements, you know, supplements are called supplements for a reason. They are to be on top of drinking enough water, eating enough protein, having your fruits and veggies and, and all of that. So I'm often helping them make sure that they, um, as I mentioned, sleep enough, drink enough water, you know, just even go for a walk, you know, um, with the dog or what have you, uh, learn how to do things like uh, put the night shift onto all of their electronics so that they can sleep better. And I think that that is really, you know, when I think back about skating, I mean, I really made sure that I was well rested and nourished so that I could uh, skate fantastically, that nothing would hold me back. And I think that my self-care today is expressive of, you know, my legacy in terms of being able to help people and hopefully inspire them to make healthy choices. And the better, uh, the healthier I am without being a maniac, I still eat tortilla chips and I still like cocktail hour. Um, you know, it, it's, it enables me to also have my brains in really good order for, let's say that I have a client come to me with a really cool patentable idea for luggage or someone who wants, you know, a naturopath who wants to create good for you chocolates. I mean, th th it's really interesting. And, and so I put, you know, me taking good care of myself means that I can serve everyone better. And I think that's really the key point. Yeah, I think that's, I think it's so important. And, and what we do with the Anthropology podcast is really, we talk about these health issues, because our core belief is that when people are well, they can change the world in whatever way they want to do that. But if you don't have your health, you're not going to think the way you want to think, and you're not going to be able to support your clients the way you want to. So I love having you here because you're really espousing uh, those values that, uh, that drive us every single day. What are some of the core tenets that you are doing for your physical health now? You look fabulous. I remember when you, you sent some, some things over beforehand and, uh, and you mentioned your age and I was like, she's, she's, she's joking. Like she, you look 25 years younger than you, um, than you are. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I have nothing against aging, but what I love is the ability to feel graceful and energetic in your body as you do it. And you, you've got all of those things together. So what's your secret, Sydney? Well, I really think it has, I, I feel that I have seven key steps to optimal health, you know, for whatever it is we want to go out in the world to do. And I, my first one is I, I do have my morning practices. I make sure that I, you know, and, and everybody can do different types of morning practices. These are mine. I have my gratitude journal. I uh, do morning pages to get all that stuff and nonsense that rolls around in my head and gets in the way of what I want to create for the day. I have my meditations and, and I, I also have, you know, a few other notebooks that I just sort of fill up with 
um, what I want to dream into, like uh, the ideas as I was describing for, you know, the entrepreneurs is to look at the beginning and look at how they want to feel in the end about how proud they're going to be of the things that they have created. I also make fairly healthy nutritional choices. It doesn't have to be complicated, but I make sure that I uh, eat enough um, of everything. And if I wanted to lose weight, I'm going to eat one bite less. And if I want to gain weight, I'm going to eat one bite more. I make sure that I walk with my dog. I go to the gym three times a week. I also look to make healthy choices in the pH balance. I like to put um, lemon in my water. I make sure that I drink enough water. I think that it, you know, I think we're more like human beings, not human beings. You know, we first need water and, and sunshine. And, you know, getting out to, you know, walk the dog, certainly make sure that I get out into, um, you know, uh, out in the sun. But talking about the alkaline and healthy choices and pH balance, I think that if people knew more about which vegetables um, and which foods to choose from, because it's not that alkaline and not that acid is bad for you. It's just that you need to have it in balance. So if you can have more of the alkaline choices, which might be, you know, uh, cauliflower, celery, um, maybe cucumbers instead of having um, tomato, um, more tomatoes, it's just a balance between them. And that's going to help you uh put up that great um, healthy boundary so that germs we're all going to bump into germs but they're not going to kind of attach themselves to you if you have a more alkaline body so that's one of the ways that i keep myself super healthy i do supplement i don't personally i don't believe that we are living you know say 50 years ago when you know maybe foods were naturally more nourishing i do think that the earth is getting depleted so while i feed myself well i also supplement because i think we are living in extraordinary times and that the world is expecting extraordinary things from us so our output is more so we in my opinion we need to supplement and i also do things like you know make sure that i wash away the cares of the day you know um i think it's really important to set my electronics to um, have um, that night shift because, you know, that blue light is going to keep you up and it's going to be hard to get a nice restful sleep if, if you don't sleep long enough. So those are really some of the key practices that I personally do. And I think that it's, um, as you said, I'm, I'm reflecting back on the fact that in 17 days, I'm going to be the big 6-0. And I'm, I think these are, this is how I'm going to uh, step into, I'm going to call it my next 60 years and be what I'm going to call fabulous forever. I love that idea. You know, you've been through a lot of change in your life and your your story is so fascinating. What would you tell someone who's facing huge change or really trying to get their feet back on the ground? Maybe they've had a disappointment or things have moved in a direction they didn't expect. How do they navigate that to not only survive, but really thrive the way that you have? Well, I think that the first thing that one needs to do is is to not rush, not um, be reactive, but to get grounded, to nurture themselves, to put time and effort into that self-care because they're going to need everything they've got. You know, and if, if this challenge is something that makes them not feel well, then they're going to have to take the time to heal themselves. And in that reflective time, they can then, when they start feeling better, look for the gift inside the challenge the i mean for myself for instance when i my i was wrapping up my fashion career i was never going to leave it it was too much fun but there was something else on the other side of that doorway that was waiting for me and it was sort of like do i accept the the adventure and so that's really what i would say it's just, is to slow down take care of yourself and to reflect on maybe what's going to make you feel better. Sydney, what do you want your legacy to be? I really have two legacies. Um, one is that, of course, I would love to help lift people up and to make sure that they're feeling as healthy and well as possible. So for those who um, have, you know, for all of us, we, we all have gifts inside of us that I believe that, you know, need to be brought to light. And so if they're feeling, if people are feeling um, optimally well, they're going to be able to go out into the wild blue yonder and 
you know, bring their gifts to life. And, and I think that's our raison d'etre. So my legacy would be first to help people feel, you know, fabulous and go off into the wild blue yonder and do that. On the other side, um, I do see people struggling with bringing their dreams to life. Maybe as we were talking earlier, maybe it's a product, maybe it's something that they've wanted to develop, but they don't know how. So I've had many of my dreams um, come, you know, I've already lived many of my dreams and, and I'm, I feel very blessed about it. So if I can uh, lend a helping hand on guiding them towards um, really bringing their dreams to life, then that, that would, then, I, then I'm going to say I could ha- uh, die happy. On October 26th and 27th, we're doing something really special in Toronto. For those of you who have been hanging out on the Anthropology podcast for a period of time, you know that we are driven by the mission that when people are well, they can change the world. On October 26th and 27th, I'm going to be hosting an event in Toronto called Impact Lives. This event has been designed for clinician entrepreneurs and wellness entrepreneurs in general who want to learn how to amplify their business. We are bringing in keynote speakers from across North America and implementation session leaders to help you not only become more inspired with respect to your business, but to learn new skills that you can start to implement right away. Whether you want to launch your own podcast, write your first book proposal, or create a system for patient acquisition or new clients that takes your business to the whole new level, we have got your back. Impact Lives is a two-day event taking place at the Globe and Mail Centre in downtown Toronto in a stunning venue that overlooks the city. It's going to bring together 150 passionate entrepreneurs looking to take the lives of their families, themselves, and the people that they work with to a whole new level. For those of you who have been loyal listeners, I would love to have you there. There is a coupon code that I am releasing just for listeners of the Anthropology Podcast. That is Anthropology20. And if you go to impactlivesevent.com, you can use that coupon code to receive 20% off the ticket price for the event happening in October. I cannot wait to see action takers, go-getters, and anthropologists like yourselves there when we gather together for Impact Lives. I love that. And and what a perfect place to transition to the last portion of the interview. And I call this section our KPIs or key performance indicators. So just like we have them in business, I believe we have them in how we live our lives as well. So I've got six rapid fire questions for you. Okay. All right. First one. I know you talked about the morning, but do you have a consistent evening routine? And if so, can you share? Yes, my evening routine is to make sure that I, well, I I listen to a meditation as I wash up and I take care of my little birdie because I have a dog and a bird. And so I make sure that he's cool because he always gets stressed when I'm putting him to bed. (laughs) It sounds funny, but uh, I really make sure that I try to go to bed around 10 o'clock at night and to prepare myself because I think that people, you know, you can't just throw yourself in bed and think you're going to fall asleep. You need to decompress and that, that would be the first thing that I have a process to decompress and to get ready for sleep time. Such wise insight. Fiction or nonfiction, what are you reading right now? I am reading nonfiction. A friend of mine is a wonderful writer. His name is uh, David Maurice Sharp. He wrote a book called Thrive, which is all about uh, the artist's journey to learn how to how to manage their finances when finances go up and down. And I think it's not only great for artists, for those of us who are entrepreneurs who are going to have incomes who are not, you know, like the weekly paycheck. Yeah, what a great, uh, what a great concept. What is the one thing you're most consistent with, with respect to your health? Drinking water. Great one. What is something totally badass about you that people would not otherwise know? I'm an advanced scuba diver. Huh, that is badass. I like that. What do you do for fun or play? I, what do I do for fun or play? Um, I love Frisbee. Like I, I am a, I'm a secret, even though I have long nails, I have a secret passion for carrying my Frisbee around with me and just do pickup games. Sydney, you're full of secrets. Last question for you. Entrepreneurism. Are we born this way or do we learn to become entrepreneurs? 
Oh, goodness. I think that we are, it's in our DNA. I think that we're born with an inkling, whether or not it expresses itself early. There's something that loves risk and challenge and creation. So I think it's a, a born to, yeah, it's in our DNA. I love it. Well, you are a born entrepreneur. Your story is inspiring. Sydney Marr, it's been a pleasure having you. Tell us where people can find a little bit more about what you're up to. Well, I have um, my two websites. There is Sydney Mar Wellness, and that is spelled C Y D N E Y, Mar M A R Wellness.com. And that is where I hang out for helping people with their health and beauty for my natural vitamins and supplements. And then if they do have a product or they, you know, are looking for information, there's lots of information on my SydneyMar.com, which is my product development strategy uh, website where lots of information, as I said, for learning how to scale up, costing, for figuring out how to do a presentation, uh, all sorts of fun things on that for product development. Amazing. And we'll hook everybody up in the show notes with links to all of these. Sydney, thanks for taking your time for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Megan. If you enjoyed our conversation and would like to hear more, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and subscribe to the Anthropology Podcast. We would also really appreciate a quick review. When people have their health, they can change the world. Let us keep you healthy and you go change the world.